funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. The English poet Gerard Manley Hopkins lived from 1844 to 1889 and is considered a colossus of English literature. Few people realise that he spent the last five years of his life living and working in Ireland during the 1880s. It was a politically contentious period in Irish history, with anti-English sentiment rife. Timmy Conway, Hopkins enthusiast and former Irish senator. There was a whole revolution going on here, and he came into the middle of it as a Jesuit and as a teacher and as a poet and as an intellectual. The English were hated, and the fact is that he had a, a name, Hopkins, and that he spoke in a different language, and he was an intellectual, and he was kind of nose up in the air. He wasn't really that at all. He was totally different, but he never got to understand, and they never got to understand him. It must have been very difficult for him to have people saying terrible things about his country when he felt that the British Empire was a, a boon to the world and that no man could have anything more desirable to happen to him than that he be born an Englishman. Richard O'Rourke of the Monastreven Hopkins Society and due in part to the alienation that the English poet Hopkins experienced in Ireland as well as due to his own inner demons he wrote some of his most dark poetry in Ireland. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. Yet despite the alienation and doom and gloom of much of Hopkins' early poetry in Ireland, nevertheless, he did eventually find solace and friendship of sorts among Irish people such as the McCabe family in Dublin as well as the Casty family in Monastreven, County Kildare. If you ever visit modern Monastreven town, there's a monument there celebrating Hopkins' happy connection with the place. The monument consists of two statues, one of Hopkins and the other of his Monastreven host, Mary Cassidy, Richard O'Rourke. This is the Hopkins monument in Monastreven. We're very uh, proud of this monument. It's done by uh, sculpted by a friend of mine, James McKenna, a marvelous sculptor, who spent hours, weeks, months sculpting a lifeless piece of limestone into these marvelous, memorable pieces to commemorate George Manley Hopkins and his time here in Monastreven and his association with Miss Cassidy, the lady who really, because of her kind hospitality, Hopkins described her as be, has, had become the props and struts of his existence. So uh, I think James has interpreted those lines of Hopkins remarkably well, this lovely, genial lady, and Hopkins with the book in hand, all looking into the middle distance. During his time in Monastreven in County Kildare, Gerard Manley Hopkins was inspired to write a poem about two local children. The poem is entitled On the Portrait of Two Beautiful Young People. The poem that he's associated with here in Monastreven he, tells a lovely story of family, of young children. And, you know, there's a great sense of, you know, he's in a family happy situation. A juice rides rich through bluebells, in vine leaves, and beauty's dearest, veriest vein is tears. Happy the father, mother of these, too fast, not that but thus far all with frailty blessed in one fair fall. And we'll hear more of Hopkins' Monastreven inspired poem shortly. Historical archives record that the poet wrote roughly one third of his poems in Ireland. This is the story of Gerd Manley Hopkins in Ireland 
with a special focus on his happy connection with Monastreven in County Kildare. His links with Kildare are very important. Monastreven, it was a very good thing for him because of the relaxation of so much. He was physically removed from Dublin. Hopkins went there and it was a haven for him, an oasis for him. He spent some time down visiting Monastery Avon. He would have been out in the bogs around here and he often talks about the sweet bog air coming from city life in Dublin like the Liffey wasn't as clean as it was today. Lovely people and superb scenery. He must have drunk in God's grandeur here. No place better than Monastery Avon. And before we hear more about Hopkins in Ireland, first we need to investigate his English roots. He was born into a well-to-do upper-middle-class family in 1844. Norman White, Hopkins scholar and also author of the book Hopkins in Ireland. His father was actually called Manly Hopkins. And if you start with his father, his father belonged to a very literate family but they were very poor couldn't afford to send him to university and so he worked as just an ordinary clerk in a marine insurance office and worked his way up by hard work to being a really prosperous expert in his own line which of marine insurance so that when Hopkins was born they came to live after a few years in Hampstead in North London, which is one of the most prosperous areas, very upper class. And Hopkins, you sense that he never really realised that his father had done the hard work in the family to get to that position. And Jared had it exceedingly easy. He did well at school, but not that brilliantly. He went to Oxford University, got into the best college of that time. This was the 1860s. He got into Balliol College. Well, Hopkins had Anglican roots, upper, middle class, very English, very Tory, very imperialist in his instincts. Paddy Bush, poet and also author of the celebrated poem called Hopkins on Skellig, Michael. And it was during his years in Oxford University in the 1860s that Hopkins converted from the Anglican to the Roman Catholic faith under the guidance of the well-known English Catholic convert John Henry Newman. Soon after his conversion to Catholicism, Hopkins became a Jesuit priest and then lived and worked in various UK locations. Eventually, after a few years, he took up a teaching post in the year 1884 in Dublin's Catholic University, which had been originally established by Newman, Hopkins scholar Norman White. Look, Hopkins turned up in Dublin quite innocently in February 1884. And so the end of the first academic year would be July 1884. He discovered to his horror a number of lectures he had to do, nil. He was given examining and only examining right the way through the year. Now, it wasn't just students of the college. It was students of the Royal University of Ireland. So there were a thousand or more papers to mark. And as he said, you know, 331 accounts of the Punic Wars, you can't get much originality from them. But he was absolutely horrified by this. Also, he was very scrupulous. And he found that other professors would, Mark would give somebody 105% in in a paper, whereas he would give them 33 and two thirds percent or something like, like that. And he was kept up to all hours doing this, or he kept himself up to all hours. And although Hopkins did eventually get to lecture Irish students, nevertheless, things were far from rosy. Irene Kiffin, who's written on Hopkins as well as performed his poetry to jazz music. He really was very unhappy teaching these lads. He had enormous bundles of checking. It was boring. It was dull work. And... It was just very, very hard. So in Ireland, he was alienated from his roots. 
people with the difficulty of Irish students who might might have been of a lower quality at this time. Hopkins enthusiast Jerry Murta. Here's Timmy Conway. Badly treated. He isolated himself. Then he was correcting all these essays and it was just hardship for him. And as was touched on earlier, because Ireland was ruled by Britain during the 19th century, anti-English sentiment was rife. Norman White. There certainly would have been a lot of anti-English sentiment um, because at that time it was the Land League, there were the Republican forces of propaganda. There were also numerous insensitivities of, of Britain from the military to the political and um, Hopkins, I don't think, could have been understood at all. There was his his accent, his voice, would certainly have been that of an over-refined, not to say effeminate, Oxford graduate who really had no place in Ireland at that time. Hopkins was an Englishman living and working in Dublin during an extremely troubled period in Anglo-Irish relations. He was in a world completely foreign and strange, where an Englishman, even if he was a Catholic, never knew if he was accepted. Augustinian priest and poet, Porrick Daly. It must have been pretty awful. First of all, he was very much an Englishman and found republicanism and these people wanting to break away from England so difficult. When I was a young student, we had some English lads who came over to do novitiate and study in Ireland. And they were totally at sea because here was a place where, first of all, England wasn't that important. And maybe in some ways, England wasn't the wonderful place that they had thought it was. They find it quite difficult. And Hopkins must have felt that. And now when you go to Stephen's Green and you see... Newman House and 86 and all those places. They're lovely and they're modernised and they're fresh and clean and newly painted. But it was an awful dump. It was almost a tenement when he went into it. And it's worth noting that although the Jesuits ran the Catholic University in Stephen's Green, Dublin, where Hopkins lived and worked, nevertheless... The university buildings themselves were owned by the Roman Catholic hierarchy, who failed to properly maintain them. As a result, Hopkins suffered further. Timmy Conway. He lived in poverty. I mean, the the, the row between the, the cardinals and the, they wouldn't even provide books for the library. They took the library out of the university. They wouldn't give them anything. And there he was left isolated and alone and cut off from his own people. He had Irish students who were always giving out about England, his country, the place he loved, the father of all his thoughts. He was aware of being different, of perhaps being unwanted. He didn't seem to fit into the Ireland that was going on around him. He probably was a bit down in himself and depressed. By the spring of 1885, just over a year after Hopkins had begun working in Dublin, his mental health had deteriorated much and he began suffering severe depression. Despite this, ever the consummate poet, he strove to describe his psychological turmoil as graphically as possible, in a string of poetic masterpieces which are nowadays known as the Dark or Terrible Sonnets. One such dark sonnet is called To Seem the Stranger, Paddy Bush. To Seem the Stranger is the only poem where he specifically mentions Ireland and his feeling of alienation. It's the most straightforward in that way. And I think his loneliness and isolation becomes part of the fabric of the poem. To seem the stranger lies my lot. My life 
among strangers. Father and mother dear, brothers and sisters, are in Christ not near, and he my peace, my parting, sword and strife. England, whose honour, oh, all my heart woos, wife to my creating thought, would neither hear me were I pleading, plead nor do I. I, weary of idler being, but by where wars are rife. I am in Ireland now. Now I am at a third remove. Not but in all removes I can, kind love, both give and get. Only what word wisest my heart breeds? Dark heaven's baffling ban bars, or hell's spell thwarts. This to hoard unheard, heard unheeded, leaves me a lonely began. the actual w wording, the verbal fabric of that, the I am in Ireland now, now I am as a third remove, that double now, now, it's like a bell tolling, leaves me a lonely began. It's past tense. It's not a lonely beginning, he says. It's a lonely began, as if it's all over, as if the way people say he's a great future behind him. There, there's a sense of an ending of mourning in it, and that's that's what the feeling of exile seems to induce in them. Paddy Bush. Here's Timmy Conway commenting on the dark sonnets in general. You have to remember that he was in a bedroom and he was cold and there was no heat. And he was also, the whole place was, was awful because all the sewers were, you know, the whole place, the, the, the Liffey, I remember. Bad plumbing, in other words. Though the whole thing was just a disaster. And there was typhoid everywhere. And um, he, was, he was just disintegrating as himself as a person. He was disintegrating. And he just, there was no hope. So he wrote the, the poems. And I can understand how he wrote them in that terrible depression and with no hope, no future. The whole place collapsing around him in a different land, not wanted, not appreciated, and um, lonely, desperate and to get up and write those poems. It is just the soul talking. It is the spirit of him talking. And although Gerard Manley Hopkins felt very alienated in Dublin in his early years there, many experts believe that other factors were to play regarding his motivation to write the dark sonnets, such as his recurring ill health and also his own inner demons. Desmond Egan U.S. National Poetry Award-winning poet living in County Kildare, a founding member of the Gerard Manley Hopkins Society and also artistic director of the Gerard Manley Hopkins International Literary Festival. Hopkins was sickly everywhere. I was out in St. Binos where he spent three years as a Jesuit student and while he was there he was so sick they had to stop him from fasting during Lent as a, you know, as a student. They had to send him into St. Asaph for a few days to try and recover his strength. He was never very strong, and he also was a, a bit hypersensitive. And he brought that kind of mentality uh, and those problems with him to Ireland, but they weren't created by Ireland, and to suggest as much is rubbish. And Paddy Bush believes that the dark sonnets are ultimately rooted in Hopkins' own inner darkness. I think they're coming from his own inner darkness. Again, I don't think it's particularly Ireland. The letter to Bridges, which he wrote, almost immediately arrived. He says that Dublin is a dreary place and it's quite, I think in my heart it's quite as smoky and dreary as London. Uh, you know, it was an internal thing. 
there's a, a very interesting thing. Before he wrote the Sonnets of Desolation, in St. Patrick's Day, 1885, he writes a meditation note and he considers St. Patrick's exile and suffering. Now, he was on Stephen's Green on St. Patrick's Day. There had been bands marching around. There were thousands of people in the street. And here's Hopkins considering his exile and suffering. He must have been the only person in Ireland who could have been considering St. Patrick's exile and suffering at that time. He's thinking of himself. Ireland was good to him. He wrote one third of his poems, including some of his greatest poems what are called the dark sonnets are a kind of a dialogue with despair in which he never despairs. He manages to face up to the horrors and still to come out of it with some sort of positive message and positive attitude. So it's wrong and very wrong and unfair to say he came over to Ireland and fell into depression. He was always, as I said, a bit prone to... Not, it's not really depression, isn't it? There must Maybe be melancholy. Dis- dystim- dystimia is the word, dystimia. And at times, you know, he had to battle with that. Hopkins regretted not having taken a vacation from Dublin in the Christmas of 1885. As a result, the following year, he took up the offer of staying with the Casty family in Monastreven in County Kildare. Paddy bush. The Cassidy household wanted a uh, priest for their Christmas ceremonies and whatever and uh, being an influential family approached the Jesuits presumably in Clongos and Hopkins went there and it was a haven for him, an oasis for him as the Cassidy household because here you had a Catholic family which are you know what Irish people, most Irish people at the time would probably have referred to as Castle Catholics. Uh, So they were loyalist, unionist and Catholic. And this is what Hopkins craved culturally. I think it's that as much as the Monaster Evan, the place. Hopkins' hosts in Monaster Evan were Mary Casty and her sister, Eleanor. Hopkins scholar, Norman White. Well, Mary Cassidy, first of all, was known as Miss Cassidy, which was the short way of saying that she was the eldest girl in the family. The others wouldn't be called Miss Cassidy. So her Christian name wouldn't actually be used. But she must have had a power in that house. I imagine her always as not quite stiff upper lip, but but not letting anybody get the better of her, of having her own way of making people into her servants. And uh, Hopkins knew that they liked his Balliol kind of jokes. Now, I can't imagine anybody in Dublin liking his Balliol jokes, but these women did. And he was with two women, and there would be the odd male servant around, but no other men, as far as I know, except when there were guests, at table, at breakfast, uh, when they had dinner or something like that. So when he came here and these two ladies, Mary Cassidy and her widowed sister, Eleanor, these ladies, they were really made a fuss about him and made him so welcome that he really felt at home. Richard O'Rourke of the Monastreven Hopkins Society. Somebody making a fuss about him and they were delighted to see him, of course. They were very religious. They were real, true Catholics and they believed in the Pax Britannica. They believed in the British Empire themselves. They were what we call Castle Catholics. They had no problem in accepting the rule of England, which a lot of people had difficulty with here in the area. And although the history of Monastreven was steeped in Irish Republican revolutionary activity, nevertheless Hopkins fell in love with the place, its pastoral setting and also his Cassidy hosts. Norman White. The Cassidys were in control of Monastreven to what seems a ridiculous kind of degree nowadays, and they controlled trade, and everybody who was in Monastreven would have contact with the Cassidys and would acknowledge that they were the superiors, they were the one who paid wages, they were the one who was responsible for the well-being of everybody in, in Monastreven. <laughs> 
And this was as it should be. And it's very much in one's cerebrum at that time, there would be this imperial sense of the people on top and the people underneath and the people who acknowledged that the people above were right. I'll just read out some of the things that he did say about Monstraven. He writes on the 2nd of January, uh, 87, Our Institute, uh, UCD, or uh, 86 Stephen Screen, provides us means of discouragement, and on me they have had all the effects that could be expected or wished, and rather more. And he goes on to say, I'm staying till tomorrow morning, alas, with kind people at a nice place. So he was writing from Monstraven. So he's described uh, his stay in Manus Revan as something very pleasant. And in January, he says, I had, in spite of the severe cold, some very pleasant days down in County Kildare at Christmas and again at New Year. And this was Manus Revan. And it was a happy acquaintance to make, for they made no secret of liking me and want me to go down again. So that he's obviously been made feel very welcome. I'm sure these two uh, sisters are looking after him very well. And This would be the Cassidy sisters. The Cassidy's. The Cassidy sisters were obviously very welcoming and delighted to have him. He writes again, uh, you know, I wished, uh, uh, he was a bit embarrassed in himself at what he had said, you know, the people liking him. He said, I wished I had never written that silly letter about the people at Monaster Revan liking me. I suppose he felt a bit self-conscious about it. But again, he writes later on, I should have felt better for the delicious bog air of Monaster Revan. And... uh, he made a. He was very good at line drawings, and he has a nice line drawing of, and it's signed off Monaster Evan, Xmas, eighty eight, and it looks like it's a river with trees in the background. He was often in ill health, and and so it was also something of a health retreat for him, uh, for to recuperate from both the stress and physical health. He, he d- didn't usually eat very well or eat very much. Kevin T. McEnany, poet and literary critic from Amenia, New York. Here's Richard O'Rourke. I should say that on the morning of Christmas Day, 1887, he assisted in giving communion in Monastery Evan, and he says, Many hundreds come to the rail with the unfailing devotion of the Irish, whose religion hangs suspended over their politics, as the blue sky over the earth, both in one landscape, but immeasurably remote and without contact or interference. This phenomenon happens to be particularly marked at Monaster Revan. And he goes on in this letter to Bridges, Who is Miss Cassidy? It's almost as if he was afraid that he had mentioned Miss Cassidy in previous letters, and after all, he is a Jesuit priest and... What is he doing with a, a Miss Cassidy? So he's more or less defending himself as well. And he said, goes on to say, she is an elderly lady. So he's clearing the, the decks there. She's an elderly lady who, by often asking me down to Monastraven, and by the change and holiday her kind hospitality provides, is become one of the props and struts of my existence. And really... A larger compliment would be hard to pay to anybody to say that somebody had become so much a part of your life that you really felt you couldn't get on without them. I think that gives a clear picture of Hopkins' liking for the town. In Monastraven, Hopkins found creative space, and as a result he wrote a poem there, Norman White. This poem, uh, On the Portrait of Two Beautiful Young People, as it suggests, was provoked by Hopkins seeing a picture of two children who he knew who were relatives of Mrs. Weevil, who was one of the two women in Monastery Evan House. And um, he saw this portrait, and it was obvious that the painter of the portrait had not just painted what he saw of the two children in all their beauty and youth and all their promise, but also was conscious of there would be a decay in them, that these young people would actually fall into decay. And so Hopkins starts off in a very optimistic mood, seeing this portrait, what a lovely thing. But then his natural progression of thought is 
towards death, towards decay. Again and again his poems as this decay crops up. And so he wrote this poem. And the poem begins. On the portrait of two beautiful young people, a brother and sister. Oh, I admire and sorrow. The heart's eye grieves discovering you, dark tramplers, tyrant years. A juice rides rich through bluebells, in vine leaves, and beauty's dearest, veriest vein is tears. Happy the father, mother of these, too fast, not that but thus far all with frailty blessed in one fair fall. But for time's aftercast, creatures all heft, hope, hazard, interest. And are they thus? The fine, the fingering beams, their young delightful hour do feature down that fleeted, else like day dissolved dreams, or ringlet race on burling barrow brown. In On the Portrait to, to Beautiful Young People, he talks about the River Barrow, uh, a very sweet little river which runs through Mon Monastreben still. And uh, not just that, but um, there's the portrait itself, which was very much connected with Monastreven, connected with the people of Monastreven. And then there's the juice rides rich through bluebells. Now, bluebells, Monastreven had uh, very famous bluebell woods, which uh, I've seen, in fact, and they are really lovely. And they're uh, in the grounds of Moor Abbey. So that makes it even more kind of connected up with Monastreven. He mentions outside Moor Abbey, he says, which is a beautiful park. The country is flat, bogs and river and canals. The river is the barrow, which the old Irish poet calls the dumb barrow. I call it the burling barrow, he says. Both descriptions are true. The country has nevertheless a charm. The two beautiful young people live within an easy drive. That's the two children of the poem. They speak about... Monastreven being his locus genii, the, the place that inspired and, and could only promote the poem that he was trying to finish. And that's the one and the portrait of the beautiful young people. She leans on him with such contentment fond, as well the sister sits, would well the wife. His looks, the soul's own letters, see beyond, gaze on, and fall directly forth on life. But ah, bright forelock, cluster that you are of favoured make and mind and health and youth, where lies your landmark, sea mark, or soul star? There's none but truth can stead you. Christ is truth. There's none but good can be good, both for you and what sways with you, maybe this sweet maid. None good but God, a warning waved to one once that was found wanting when good weighed. It's kind of very gentle, and compared with most of his other Dublin poems, the rhythm of it is so easy, so sweet, so nice. Man lives that list, that leaning in the will, no wisdom can forecast by gauge or guess. The selfless self of self, most strange, most still, fast furled and all foredrawn, to no or yes. Your feast of, that most in you earnest eye, may but call on your banes to more carouse. Worst, 
will the best. What worm was here, we cry, to have havoc pocked so, see, the hung heavenward bows. Enough. Corruption was the world's first woe. What need I strain my heart beyond my ken? Oh, but I bear my burning witness, though, against the wild and wanton work of men. Gerard Manley Hopkins loved the outdoors, and during his visits to Monastreven, he took many walks. Removed as he was from Dublin City, he could pretend that his problems had gone away. Morgan McCabe, PRO of the Gerard Manley Hopkins International Literary Festival. Hopkins is a huge love of nature and uh, while he worked as a priest he always fell back on nature for his inspiration and to save his soul and uh, he just saw beauty in everything around him in nature. Hopkins, he found Monstreven very pleasing. He enjoyed coming here to the Cassidy's because they were Catholics and then it was a big house. They were the ones that were making him feel comfortable. My own experience as an Englishman in Ireland was that Monstreven was the place I liked best as well. And Monstreven people who I've known and got to know and like very much, you know, they've carried on the same Monstreven tradition of kindliness and generosity and welcoming. It's important to stress it over the course of his five years in Ireland. Hopkins slowly made his peace with his own inner demons, as well as gaining a better understanding of Irish politics. Kildare County Councillor Ivan Keatley. It was extraordinary. He was probably a man ahead of his time in that, you know, he, he almost did accept the fact that home rule was, was inevitable. Um, and I, I, I'd say he probably only realised that by actually coming and living amongst the Irish themselves. After spending Christmas 1888 in Monastreven, Hopkins returned to the damp conditions of his living quarters in Newman House in Stephen's Green, Dublin. Unfortunately, shortly afterwards, he died from typhoid in June 1889. From a literary perspective, Hopkins wrote one of his most famous poems in Dublin the year before he died, Desmond Egan. Let's remember, he wrote in Dublin the year before he died one of his greatest life-affirming poems, which is That Nature is a Heraclitean Fire, which is a fantastic poem and very positive, full of joy and full of belief full of hope, everything that people disregard about Hopkins' uh, time in Dublin. And the last portion of the poem goes as follows. Enough! The resurrection! A heart's clarion! Away, grief's gasping, joyless days! Dejection! Across my foundering deck shone a beacon, an eternal beam. Flesh fade, and mortal trash fall to the residuary worm. World's wildfire leave but ash. In a flash, at a trumpet crash, I am all at once what Christ is, since he was what I am, and this Jack choke poor Potchard Patch Matchwood Immortal Diamond 
is Immortal Diamond. From the line quoted, this Jack joke, potsherd, poor, you know, out of that jumble, which is the human condition, comes Immortal Diamond. That's the finish of it, which is the human spirit, the human soul, if you like, which somehow manages to assert itself in the midst of problems and all the difficulties and tragedy of humanity. That's what I love about it. His line, you know, I'm all at once what Christ is since he was what I am. This is him finding himself, isn't it? And understanding what he is, you know, the, the resurrection. He went through a period of losing his faith, found it again by the end of his life. Andy Wilton Jones. Here's Paddy Bush. It's wonderful to know that he wrote it after a walk in Dublin, but the poem exists even if you don't know that, and it's just as real and just as immediate. His whole life, like anyone's, is an adventure, a discovery, a battle. Uh, He had to face up to difficulties and some big disappointments and drawbacks and so on and still he managed to die saying three times you know his dying words I am so happy I am so happy I am so happy After Hopkins was buried in the Jesuit plot in Glasnevin Cemetery, Dublin, in 1889, his poems remained unknown to the general public for 29 years, until his friend Robert Bridges began publishing them from 1917 onwards. So just how important was Dublin and Ireland to Gerard Manley Hopkins? Desmond Egan. How important was Dublin? Well, he wrote about one-third of his poetry there and a few down the country. Hopkins, we were actually lucky to have him. I see his time in Ireland as a kind of journey through suffering to a kind of resignation at the end. Paddy Bush. Here's literary critic Kevin T. McEnany. His great poems were actually written here. You know, not only Nature nature as a Heraclitian Fire, I think his greatest poems are written here. Yeah. In Ireland, really? Yes, in Ireland, right. I mean, but they're yeah. all later poems. I mean, you know, any poet develops to a certain point, and he had perfected a lot of his practice in terms of his craft by, by the time he arrived here in Ireland. On a personal note, as a lifelong lover of Hopkins' poetry, I'm extremely proud of his happy connection with my own native county, Kildare especially his happy periods of rest spent in Monastreven town. Also, it shouldn't be forgotten that Hopkins had many other connections with Kildare places, such as Clongo's Wood College. Gerard Manley Hopkins was a colossus of English literature, revolutionising poetry and catapulting it from the Victorian into the modern era. Until we meet again some other hidden avenue of literary history, I'm going to leave you with various contributors talking about the revolutionary nature of Hopkins' poetry. Irene Kiffin. He was the seminal poet for modern poetry. The test of his modernity is that if Hopkins were published for the first time today, he would be seen as being revolutionary. He's had an enormous impact on world poetry for the beauty of what he did himself, but also for his experiments and for the way he brought things forward out of the Victorian age. His poetry, they reckon he's one of the best ever. And uh, he developed the sprung rhythm, very careful use of words, 
words that just flow and flow and flow and dance off each other. Poetry written over the last hundred years has been different because of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.